I would like to draw parallels between two seemingly very, very different areas of physics. So in particular, I would like, so what we are going to investigate uh, in detail, theory and experiment, is to study nonlinear Faraday waves. And these nonlinear Faraday waves, they will uh, occur on liquid-liquid interface. And what I'm going to do in order to sort of mathematically understand what's going on, or also perhaps the motivation for this study, comes from an area very different from fluid dynamics. It comes from uh, field theory in the early universe. And in particular, there is a mechanism that's called preheating. And that's the mechanism that tells us how after inflation, everything, the whole universe thermalizes. And the idea was that perhaps we can use some of the mass developed within cosmology to understand a bit uh, in more detail what's happened on this liquid-liquid interface. Okay, so at first this might sound quite crazy. So let me first uh, give a bit of a, um, a history of how, in general, one would connect cosmology to fluid dynamics, and in what way. So the idea goes back to 1980, when uh, Bill Anru gave a lecture in fluid dynamics. So for the ones who don't know Bill, Bill is an expert in gravity, in quantum, uh, quantum uh, theory, quantum theory and gravity. Uh, and so he was giving a lecture at the University of British Columbia looking at uh, lecture in fluid dynamics. And during this lecture, he got an idea. He said, perhaps, you know, in the same way as light, for example, or particles behave around black holes, or for that matter, any field around black holes, perhaps sound waves in fluid flow could experience a similar behavior. So what did he mean with that? So Bill imagined a waterfall where upstream the fluid flow was slower than sound waves in the system. So and if I um, excite a little perturbation, sound waves can propagate upstream and downstream alike. Then, okay, he thought about a hypothetical waterfall where at some point the fluid flow would exceed the sound speed in the system. And so what would happen here is now all the sound waves, they have no choice but being dragged downstream. And they can't propagate against the fluid flow again, they can't propagate upstream. So now let's complete this picture a little bit. Let's think about this a bit more systematically, just as a Gedanken experiment, and then we look at the mathematics behind that. So suppose I have, I'm carrying this on now, my waterfall here upstream, the background flow is about a, let's say roughly zero, we can neglect that there is a fluid flow. And while you're going to the right, this fluid flow is increasing. The flow speed of your background flow is increasing. And let's suppose we can draw in the middle here a line, which is an area in this fluid flow where the normal of the flow velocity is everywhere equal to the sound speed in the system. And let's for now dub this as our acoustic horizon. So then I have an upstream here where sound waves or can propagate in all directions equally fast. For example, if the flow is uh, zero, roughly zero. But if I go a little bit more to the right where I have a non-zero background flow, sound waves propagate faster downstream than they propagate upstream. And then here I have this hypothetical acoustic horizon and if I uh, initiate a small perturbation here, all the sound waves will propagate downstream and he dubbed this, as I already indicated here, as the acoustic horizon. Here I have a supersonic flow. Here I have a subsonic flow. OK, so that's quite neat. But how deep is this analogy, really? And so for this, we need to go back to what we know from field theories more generally on curved space times. And to sort of motivate this here um, in, a, in a more accessible way, Let's just go through the following pass in a very simplified way. So what you see here is a second order partial wa um, wave equation that has up to second order time derivative. 
and up to second order spatial derivatives. This equation occurs in many, many areas of physics. It can describe uh, mechanical waves, sound waves in air, acoustic waves in this sense. It can describe water wave sound in water, uh, seismic waves. It can also describe light wave, electromagnetic field wave. So, and what you can do now is you can write this equation in a relativistic way. And you can do this by simply introducing uh, this metric tensor, as we call it, the Minkowski space-time tensor, which is describing flat space-time geometry. So these two equations here are identical. Nothing has changed. This is just a fancy or perhaps a compact way of writing it. What you have gained here at that point is if you now wonder what would your light, uh, your electromagnetic waves, how would they look like if you wanted to see how these light waves propagate on a general curved space-time background, you can do an ad hoc replacement. And what you can do is you can replace this flat space-time geometry with a general curved space-time geometry. And this thing here, this is this metric rank two tensor that can incorporate, for example, a black hole or an expanding universe, depending on the details of what is uh, what the entities are in my metric, in my uh, rank two tensor. Okay, so this is an ad hoc replacement where we're also assuming that the equations are not changing formally, that only this um, matter fields here only couple to this metric tensor, which we call the minimal coupling. So this in a nutshell is how people postulated field series on curved space-time. You may go ahead and quantize these matter fields in a consistent manner, of course, but this is how we do field theory on curved space-time. This is, for example, the equation Hawking used to derive his famous black hole evaporation uh, 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 results. Okay, so here is how we do uh, field theory on curved space-time. So what Bill did afterwards, he went back after he gave the lecture, and he linearized. He started with a set of Navier-Stokes equations, and derived the small per use perturbation theory. And then he got the perturbation, he got a set of coupled equations, or three coupled equations. And then what he realized, I can rewrite all of these equations in one single equation, which has exactly the same form as field theory on curved space-time. In the analogy here, what this psi field is, psi field is a perturbation in the velocity potential and here we're assuming an irrotational velocity flow. So, uh, grad psi is equal to the background, um, is the perturbation in the, in the velocity field. Okay, so this was uh, how this works. So starting from some very different physics, from the Navier-Stokes equation, you get the same set of mathematics. There's no magic, no trick, it's just a rewriting. It just pops out like that. Now you can go back and ask yourself, what can I describe with that? Well, and it turns out, if for example, your fluid, if you have um, a fluid, let's, let's take uh, water and let's look at sound waves. And if the background flow is equal to zero, and if your sound speed is everywhere homogeneous, what you get, you get this a wave equation back on flat space-time geometry, where the space-time geometry now is provided by the fluid flow. And if you want to get something a bit more fancy, for example, a black hole, you need to go back and set up supersonic um, fluid flows where you then get an acoustic horizon. So this is the whole magic. There's nothing learned in this sense beyond there is no trick or trickery. It just happens to be that, as I consider it like a gift of nature, that there is this similarity between how we things like very abstract things, what happens around black holes or in a rapidly expanding universe, that these kind of physics, this set of equations, just appear in fluid flows. Okay, and now there is an elephant in the room. Why is this in any way useful? And this is what this talk is about, is try to push this question and to see how useful this can be. 
So one may ask the question, what can we learn from analog simulations? We call them analog simulations, and you will see shortly why. Because you can, I should mention that, I cut a few slides. Uh, you can now go ahead, and now you could either work with fluids at room temperature or pressure, or you can work with superfluids, for example. And so then your sound waves are quantized, meaning all the, or you can set up cold enough temperature so that the thermal noise is below the quantum noise in the system. And there you have it now. You have quantized excitation, a quantum field theory on an effective curved space-time geometry. And you can go ahead and set up black hole, black hole physics. You can reproduce, for example, Hawking radiation in a ultra-cold atoms laboratory, for example. And why is this useful? So the first thing is, we should really understand it's an exploration of the effective field series. And this is what this talk will be about. We want to understand to a very deep level the effective field series that you get on a liquid-liquid interface. And what we want to do, of course, um, almost on a zero level, you get all these wonderfully bizarre effects that are predicted in field theory and curved spacetime. For example, Hawking radiation, Ann radiation, the Penrose effect, name it you now ha can look for them in these analog systems. So there, there is a nice textbook which is called Quantum Field Theory and Curved Space Time, and you can take it as a, as, a, as a motivation what you can look for in fluids experiments. And you can turn these ideas, these abstract ideas, because in many cases this is what they are. These are very small effects, they're undetectable, and we can't really see them. We can't make them real. So at this point, there are ideas, it's mathematics, and we can make them real. We learn how to, what it means, what it takes to actually observe these effects. Just because you work with an analog doesn't mean it's easy to detect them. And how do you get the information you need to be certain that you're dealing with a particular effect predicted from quantum field theory, classical field theory, and curved space time? The thing I'm mostly interested in is this cross-validation of theoretical toolboxes. So some very smart people in cosmology went ahead and came up with some very fancy ways of solving this set of equations. And often there is a leap of faith in there. There are a lot of approximation in there. And now if I can do this experiment well enough, I can test if these approximations actually hold. And at the same time, you can use techniques developed in cosmology and applied to fluid dynamics. And that's what we're doing. We're calculating calculating higher moments. We want to understand the transition from linear to nonlinear field theory, and we want to do this using first thermal field theory methods. And then last but not least, of course, there is this hope that, well, it's not one effect which is predicted to occur around black holes in the early universe. It's all of these effects that are shared with fluid dynamics. And so perhaps through exploration can we find some new effects that have been missed on the early universe side. And then one thing which is this talk is also is about, can we actually use these systems as simulators to calculate, to, to simulate beyond what we can calculate? So here are a lot of ambitious things, and now for this, we need to find a situation where perhaps some of these things are addressed. I need to find a difficult, a physically difficult situation where perhaps we have to stretch this analogy a bit further. We want to push it to the limit and we want to understand what the limit of my field theory simulator is. And so let's go back to this uh, gravity simulator program and let's look at the naive regime of vali uh, validity. So, well, we say there is this effective field theory and curved space time, so I'm trusting that I can't test if black holes evaporate, because that also would imply that um, this is not what this program is about, not at all. Also, we don't know, uh, in, when Hawking started to derive the black hole evaporation law, he started with a set of equations, which is exactly the set of equations I showed you earlier on. If this is a valid assumption, is a different question. It is a very reasonable assumption. It would be almost unreasonable not to start as a starting point. But for example, there could be higher, there would be, could be more terms, correction, they could become important when the black hole is very small and this Hawking radiation becomes very large. 
So the assumption is, well, this effective field zero in curved space times, that is the set of equations, and these happen to be the equations that I get in the fluid system. We're assuming here that it minimally couples to gravity, which is similar to the other thing. What we are also always assuming is, and this is some bit perhaps is this boring regime as some people perhaps might think about, it's not boring at all, can come back to this at the end. But one of the things we're assuming that every sound waves, every perturbation in my system does not speak to the others. But if I just take fluid as room temperature and pressure, the waves are talking to each other. They can scatter with each other. They, they will be dumped waves. So this mode, mode interaction is usually neglected. And what this talk is about is let's not neglect it. Let's try to see what you actually get and to what, le to what level can you check it and make a mapping between cosmology and my interacting modes uh, in, in the system we're going to study. Okay. So here was the general motivation for analog gravity and the problem, why we choose this particular problem. And now we need to find uh, an interesting physics question. And for me, interesting always comes from cosmology. That's a matter of taste. You could just say she wants to study nonlinear Faraday waves in great detail. And that would be fair enough as well. And in fact, we're using help from both theory in cosmology and some fantastic papers in fluid dynamics. Theory predictions. Okay, so here it is. Uh, this time it's not about black holes, it's about cosmology. This is the history of our universe, 13.8 billion years on one slide. So what can you actually, what is, is that which part of the history of our universe could we actually reproduce in a liquid-liquid interface? Well, the only thing we can do, we're talking about the 10 to the minus 33 seconds. That's what one can hope uh, to reproduce in a fluid system. Why is that? Because after the Big Bang, the general belief is all that there is is quantum fluctuations or small fluctuations. And then you have a rapidly expanding uh, space-time geometry, and that takes a small amplification and it produces everything. And then later on, of course, we are away from the fluids, but this is the interesting regime where there's, I have to apologize, it's really, really hard to read. I uh, will read it out to you. The fonts, the pink is not, not working quite well. So there are three different epochs where each one of them, I can tell you an analog gravity system where this is being investigated in. And so the first thing is, of course, we have the Big Bang, but what is before? And so in particle physics, people are considering pre-Big Bang scenarios. One of them is the false vacuum decay, and it's your colleague here, Soren Hachibabic, who is currently setting up a simulator for the false vacuum decay. And this is a first-order relativistic phase transition, which he wants to set up in a multi-component ultra-cold atom system. Then after the Big Bang, we all know there's this rapid phase of expansion. And I just want to put this in numbers because it is such wonderfully crazy physics. In 10 to the minus 33 seconds, the universe expands by the size of 10 to the 26. And all of this happens while the, the theory stays linear. Pretty cool. There's some really good arguments where there are a lot of interesting questions about it, and this is where the analog simulators are coming in. So, and then you have what happens here, and I just want to talk you through because it's important to the third part, which we are in, in, uh, addressing. So imagine that initially you only have quantum fluctuations. And then you have this rapid expansion, an exponential expansion in the size of your universe, 10 to the minus three sec 33 seconds ongoing. What's happening, this fluctuation that, get, that are there, they get amplified and stretched. They get stretched beyond a certain scale, which is called the Hubble scale. And what's happening then there, their frequency goes to zero. They stop oscillating. And they get converted to density perturbations. And this is what then is believed to be responsible for the large-scale structure of our universe. Under the assumption that these modes are free modes, and never talking to each other. A linear dynamic, totally 
fantastically crazy. And then, well, then you have all these modes imprinted on your background structure, and then what needs to happen now is something needs to unfreeze this mode. Something needs to take these frozen modes and thermalize it. That's the kind of physics we're interested in. It's the different stages of this heating process, thermalization process, and we are interested in the very first of that. That's called or referred to as preheating. Reheating, preheating, cosmology has a, a plethora of, of things. So and in this phase, the creation of all particles through mode-mode interaction, a nonlinear process is taking place, and that's what we want to study. OK, so uh, cosmology is fantastic. I uh, could talk hours and hours about it, but I need to be quick. So what's driving inflation? We don't know. There's no particle physics motivation, really. So in cosmology, people uh, uh, introduced a hypothetical field called the inflaton field. And at the end of inflation, this inflaton field rolls down a potential, rolls to this minimum, gets and sort of goes a periodical driving through in this minimum. And what's happening in this reheating phase is inflaton field couples to the matter field, creates a parametric resonance. And then the matter fields have some nonlinear interactions and how they're then decaying, they will thermalize all this energy that the inflaton put into certain modes and thermalize it further. Okay. And now we're going to explain this over and over again by looking at fluid systems. So if this wasn't clear, not really meant to be, we're going through it in many details. I should also make a disclaimer. There are many different cosmology models, different variants, like many, many, many. We are going to follow, but they all have sort of similar ingredients. And this is what we're looking for. And in particular, we have one, um, one particular model, which we're using or set of calculations, predictions in cosmology, which we're using to make predictions for our nonlinear Faraday waves. So there was one fantastic paper, and you will feel like, oh, she's throwing even more things at it, but this comes from ultra-cold atom systems. Ultra-cold atom systems give you this Bose-Einstein condensate, which is just uh, ideal fluid, it's a superfluid. Um, so it is an uncomplicated fluid, it's a fluid um, without any viscosity. Okay. So let me talk you through this and then we will make the jump to classical fluid dynamics. So what they're looking at is uh, a two-component Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and what they're doing is they uh, have a two-component and they go to an excited unstable state. They excite the... Um, uh, from there's a two component, phi one and phi two. And the phi two component is metastable, is unstable. So if you occupy it, what you will have, you will have a decay. And the way this decay works, it will populate this K star modes with opposite momentum so that momentum is conserved. These are exponentially growing modes. They have a growth rate two gamma star. Now, this phi-1 system, the superfluid, when amplitude sound waves are large enough in the system, there will be mode-mode interaction, nonlinearity. And when you look at this nonlinearity, they have a certain form which is called a phi to the 4 term. And this phi to the 4 interaction can be calculated with scattering amplitudes in cosmology, and this is what cosmologists love to work with. It's the, the next, the sensible next term or first term that occurs in mode, mode interaction. And turns out in this ultra-cold atom system, you ha also have this kind of phi to the four interaction. And what you see is then what the prediction is, well, these primary modes here at k star, k minus star, once the amplitudes get large enough, they will interact with the three times k star modes, and they will start occupying, scatter into those, and the prediction is, using some of the uh, approximation provided by cosmology, that the secondary growth rate is with three times the growth rate of the primary instability. Okay, now that was all the physics you perhaps are not so familiar with. I don't know, there are different people from different areas, but if you come from, from, from the fluids community, uh, this is where superfluids, cosmology is left behind, and what we're doing now is working with 
liquid-liquid interfaces. So the experimental system here is a liquid-liquid interface, and I will say much about this. We don't have an inflaton field, but what we do is we, we uh, parametrically excite the K-star mode. We, we put the whole fluid cell onto a mass spring system. And we parametrically excite this mode, just the Faraday instability, nothing fancy. So this is just the starting point. And what we then study, we study the subsequent decay. And what we are interested in is the mode, mode scattering, the secondary instabilities, and we want to extract a growth rate, but we also want to understand this field theory in great detail. This is the system. So it's a two-fluid system, and I have a height field here, which I denote with xi throughout the rest of the talk. So why liquid-liquid interface? So when I talk about understanding at a deeper level, it's about the level of precision I want. And so if you, for example, this is also a two-fluid system, but it's not liquid-liquid, it's air-liquid. should be liquid here, really. And there is a problem with this system. The problem is that if you have an open system like that, um, you will lose layers of atoms per second. You will have an evaporation rate, which is usually at the nanometers per second. So you're losing your fluid. And if you use your fluid, your effective field theory is changing because the propagation speed of this interface wave is changing. So what we want is something different. We want an effective field theory simulator that is tunable, because in our case, I want to reduce surface tension. Surface tension is something that we don't want. So we need something that's tunable. If you have two liquids, you can actually uh, make the surface tension very small. You can have, for example, a refractive index, which is smaller than on helium vapor, helium interface. It has to be controllable which means is that I am not losing my liquid, so a closed system, hence is better. And it has to be high precision measurements. So our resolution is micrometers, per, um, is down to micrometers. Um, it's not quite good enough, as you will see. But you want it down to nanometers, really. And I will tell you why. And of course, if you lose your liquid, if the system changes in the nanometer scale, there's no point in putting up precise measurements. And it has to be repeatable to study the ensemble. So by also having it closed, I can study many, many repetitions. Many here is 1,500 to study the statistical properties of these interface fluctuations. So this is an open system, and we don't like open systems. So we take, instead of that, a slightly more complicated system. We take a liquid-liquid interface. So these are two sets of Navier-Stokes equations they are going to be explicitly time dependent. And the confinement is that the velocity vanish at the cell boundaries. So we're using uh, von Neumann boundary conditions. If you want to ask me about the meniscus at the end, if I forget it, please, please remind me to mention something. OK, so here we are. Let's talk through the theory. First, the linear. Let's see what we get in the experiment and then study the nonlinear effective field theory. OK, so first of all, this interface, so this is the fluid cell, like a donut here inside the fluid. And then here you get uh, the two fluids, there's one on the uh, bottom and one on the top. I'll say more about that. And so this is a dimensional reduction. We have two spatial dimensions, because all I care about is the fluctuations on that interface. So these height fluctuations, and I just have to tell you what are the fields which we are going to investigate in more depth. So the height fluctuation is my psi field, my height field, that depends on r, the radius, theta, the angle, and it changes over time because I'm parametrically exciting it. Now, we can make a decomposition of my height field onto the eigenfunctions of the 2D Laplacian with the corresponding eigenvalue minus k squared. These are the, the um, uh, mode eigenfunctions, f, k, m, where m is the antimodal number, and k is the wave number, which you get is the eigenvalue of the 2D Laplacian, as I said. And this psi k of t, these are my coefficients, and these are my time-dependent coefficients. 
how they grow in time. The whole time dependence is in these psi fields. And because we're in the linear regime, we can also, of course, initially immediately say it's, it's uh, independent for k and m. So for each k m, I get a different set of equations. And then my, just to for um, uh, completion here, these mode functions here, this is how they look like, where this rm is a combination of first and second order Bessel functions, and this is an e to the i m antimutual number theta. So this is due to the symmetries, a rotational symmetry in the system. Very good. Okay, so fluid dynamics is not quite enough because you also need to take into account uh, the molecular structure of the fluid. So if you have your fluid uh, at rest, and suppose you could set it up in a way that there is no, it uh, decouples completely from your vibrational excitations in the lab, which is difficult at this frequency band, what you would have, you would have uh, thermal fluctuations in the system. And this thermal fluctuation is given by the Brownian motions of the um, molecules in the water. Okay, so, but what you have, so you have viscous and molecular contributions. So what you have, you have an effective linear damping. You will get the damped mature equation for the system. You have the fluctuation dissipation theorem, and it gives you a, stochast a stochastic noise term. This is the only thing which we are in our model, which we're not calculating, but is a free parameter, and I will talk a lot about that. It's not quite, I will, I will tell you what we know. It's not quite that we're completely making it up, but there is a free parameter in there. Okay, so linear theory, single mode driven linear dynamics. Okay, so the amplitudes are small. When is this system becoming nonlinear? Just to give you immediately an idea, when it's about a millimeter, then it's in the nonlinear regime. But it is linear for, in a micrometer regime, it is linear. Uh, so, so when we start with, we are not excited, so we have the system as everybody does in the Faraday instability, you start shaking it and what is sourcing this parametric resonance is the initial stochastic noise on, on whatever interface you're studying. This is just the physics of that. So this is your uh, material equation for this height field, which were my coefficients in this decomposition, which we used. And this is this psi kms, right? And so this is the dumped material equation. On the right-hand side here, I have my stochastic noise term. I am assuming, sorry, I should talk you through what you see here, this gamma k is the damping. You have linear damping. And then you have omega k, which is the frequency of the modes, and the capital omega of t, that f of t is my external driving force, okay? So I have an f of t, and I will tell you about this, this system which we built to do this. So the assumption is that the fluid is irrotational, okay, which is a good assumption here, as long as you don't develop any turbulences, which uh, we are not. Uh, decoupling of interface and bulk excitations, everyone in fluid dynamics is obviously, that's always clear. To me, it's not so clear. There's something that puzzles me about this, but it is a good approximation. I'm, I'm certain about this, but still, there needs to be a coupling between interface fluctuation and the sound fluctuations in, in the fluid. Um, and then we're assuming that we have, uh, and this is a wonderful thing, I learned something, this was one of the questions, a real question which perhaps was, was completely motivated by my lack of understanding of fluid dynamics. Or in, so, which is an infinitely thin fluid interface. So when you do this modeling, you're assuming I have these two fluids, and the one fluid is penetrating the other one, right? They're not, they're not completely, the interface is not infinitely thin. So one question I had, was, well, if there is a, a size, a thickness of this interface layer, could this perhaps mean that this effective field theory I'm dealing with would not be valid at very small scales? And this is wrong. And the person who explained it to me how to get around that was Bob Wald when he visited my lab a couple of weeks ago. And I'm happy to get back to you what I think what's how, how, vali how um, one, why it makes sense to consider interface waves of amplitudes that are much smaller than the thickness of that layer. We can go back to that at the end. 
And so, and simplify boundary conditions. So we are assuming exact uh, for Neumann boundary conditions, but there is a small meniscus. And so that one we're neglecting, but still we see that we get very good um, agreement with experimental results, but that would be one, one point of, of, of improvement. Okay, so here we are. This is our system, I will show you more. So what we want it to become interacting and nonlinear. And there's nothing nicer than parametric resonance to, in a controlled way, take a field amplitudes in a system, grow them exponentially, and see how a theory uh, changes from linear to nonlinear. So it's wonderful to study exactly this transition. Okay, okay, accelerated fluid interfaces. Oh, sorry, so I thought there's a picture coming. So this is our theory, our damped Mathieu equation with stochastic noise term. What uh, the Fouquet analysis predicts that you get this exponential, exponentially growing modes, and you would get that if you drive your mode for example, with two times omega naught, if this would be the forcing term, two times omega naught, you would get these exponentially growing modes at integers of omega naught. So you would get it of half of the driving frequency and all integers thereof. The exponential growth rate for all of these modes would be the same. That's a prediction from the damped Mathieu equation. Now, if you take into account the damping, again, the damping we are calculating the linear damping we're extracting from the system, but um, we are, we, this is in very good agreement with uh, methods where one calculates the damping rates, taking the geometry um, of the system into account, which gives a significant higher damping if you have small fluid cells. And so what we have here is uh, because you have this confinement, so first of all, you have the antimutal numbers, of course, uh, you always have to fit full wavelengths in there. They have the antimutal mode number M, but also the KR modes. The K modes are discrete because of the confinement. And so what you get is a reduced density of states. So if you have an angular frequency of omega naught and you have an antimutal wave number, you can only fit certain modes into your system. And then you predict here around omega naught and two omega naught and three and so forth. This is where uh, Fouquet analysis predicts these exponentially growing modes. But then you also have to take into account the damping in the system, which is changing with the frequency. So hence you have uh, these instability bands. These are these instability bands for given driving F naught. This is the amplitude of your driving force. And this here is the amplitude here we are in this regime, and then you can see which mode should be excited. And so here we can make clear predictions which mode should be excited, and the most dominantly one excited is the M equal four mode. <coughs> okay, so now let's, uh, these are the modes that can live in the system. Let's do the experiment. So we wanted a system where we can tune away the surface tension. So what we are using is a biphasic solution. It's ethanol water organic solution in the upper fluid and a potassium coagulate aqua solution in the lower fluid. So it's water with a bit of salt in there. So very similar. Uh, as, a, as a consequence, surface tension is very small, but also the refractive index is actually smaller than in liquid helium. So it's harder to see this interface than the helium, the interface of a liquid helium. And it has a sufficiently long lifetime. So if you, if you create this fluid cell, it has to actually be created under clean room conditions. It's something which I was quite, again, very naive, not, not really coming from the fluid, fluids community, but if you prepare, if you punch your fluids together and there's a little bit of dust in there, the dust will accumulate on the interface layer and believe it or not, completely different system. I mean, really different M modes excited. So if you were to repeat it, it wouldn't give you anything different. Would it give you something different? I, still find it amazing how a little bit of dust can spoil a whole experiment. I understand. Um, and then you need to create it in a certain way so that for, for our experiment, experimentation time is 50 hours that no air bubbles go in. Once the air bubbles in the fluid cell is, 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 is done, you can't, you can't continue. So it's a closed system, right? Airtight annular container, as I said, it has an inner uh, radius of 20 millimeter, an outer radius of 40 millimeter, so this is the difference here is 20 millimeter. And it's a cylinder machine from a certain nylon. If you, if you change the fluids, they 
any seal could be, yeah, you, you know, whatever your confinement is, you have to be mindful what the fluids, and this was a bit of a headache until we got it all right. And it has a transparent top and bottom window because our observable is this interface way. So then we realized something. So when we talk about repeating this experiment, and this is a mechanical forcing drive, and you would get what people call a shaker platform, and the ISO standard for a shaker platform is 10% between uh, vertical and horizontal shaking. So that is not uh, what we want. We want to shake the system like this. So we had to build our own um, platform. This is a spring mass system. It was uh, driven by a voice coil actuator. It is on pneumatic bearings, frictionless. Uh, air, uh, so it has, it, it is, um, it sits on these air bearings, and it has a mass spring system, so they can drive it by this uh, simple speaker. It's mounted on a noise isolation platform. It has to be, of course, uh, fantastically leveled, and it's computer operated because it has to be repeated and repeated and repeated for 50 hours. I want to mention something. By after making a bit fuss about this <laughs> for a long time and getting it right, it wasn't so easy actually. We realized then in the literature, if we at least look, it's to our knowledge, it's the best, best performing shaker system that there is. There is a shaker at MIT who also has um, hor vertical versus horizontal um, um, displacement, which is at 1%. Ours is operating over 50 hours at 0.5%. Um, maximum on average is 0.3%. And ours is also the only one which I know of that can operate for so many hours. So this is just, it's, you know, obviously it's doable to build this, but it's just not commercially available. If you need to build a shaker system, you're interested, please come to me. I'm happy to share some insights. Um, then uh, we also measure this through uh, high precision accelerometers to make sure that we understand what the motion is. Uh, temperature is a big thing. If you change the temperature, the room temperature changes by one degree, your ambient damping is changing. And you will see that this way we can measure the damping in, uh, as, a tem as a function of temperature. The methods we had to adapt are this adapted Fourier transform profilometry, which we developed, and we're using continuous wavelet analysis because we want to see at the specific frequency band how the field modes grow in time. So you want a time frequency analysis, and this is where the continuous wavelet analysis is best, especially if you have an exponentially growing signal. Experimental time scales. So the one run is 34, five seconds, a single run, single trajectory. Then we have a dead time from 85 seconds where we let the system rest. Then it starts again and it does so for 50 hours. This is how it looks like. Um, this very bright thing is the LEDs, the LEDs. Uh, so because we need to, which we need for our detection method. And this, this here is the shaker system. You see here's the camera, here's the fluid cell. And this is our mass spring system. I should mention, I should mention, these mass spring systems are also highly temperature dependent. So, uh, am I running out of time? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Is there ask now or should we? No, happy okay, to. So, um, just one question. So, um, basically, you have almost no surface tension or capillarity. So, how do you then uh, avoid the diffusion after over a thousand runs? I know, I know. Is it a good very, you know, that was the question as well. Mm. So um, you will see. We can look at what we get experimentally, and then we can come back to this question. No, it's, it's absolutely, it was a very, <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> uh, how does this hold? This mixing, would it stop mixing? Would it diffuse? Would this interface dynamics break down? Mm. Would you not have an effective field theory that would describe it? Absolutely valid question. So what you're seeing here now is that is not a simulation. What, we are, what you're seeing here, this is the interface extracted from one of our experimental runs. My student, August, he likes programming a lot. He actually calculated the light reflection on the surface, so it looks very realistic. And so he made this up, so he took this interface here where we get it. We can't quite get it on the, on, up until the boundaries. We have this window where we can see it. And then this is what we do. It shakes. And so here, this sh shows you the shaker amplitude, how it's growing, and it stays constant then. And here, this gives you an idea, this black wiggle line. It, it's not running very smoothly, unfortunately, because of the zoom details. 
but then here it shows you how the noise level changes over time. And sorry, it should be smooth. It runs smoothly on my computer. It just doesn't run smoothly here. And then what we're doing, we excite this interface, and we want to see if we can find the nonlinear theory to describe the whole, the whole lot. Okay, so what we do, we take this height, um, this interface height, and we do a Fourier transf uh, transformation to the M mode, and we use this wavelet transformation to filter in frequency. You need to also always be careful if you introduce something due to the data analysis you're carrying out, right? It's one thing of having the experiment there, but by accessing it and trying to extract this information, you may also introduce an error. So this is the experiment in a nutshell. This is our mass spring system. This is this driving force which we measure with this um, precision uh, accelerometers. And what you see is when we started, of course, this doesn't start with a sudden amplitude. It has like a naturally built-in switching function, so it, uh, it grows um, probably is one minus some exponential. I haven't actually tested that, but I guess it would be like that. And so it goes up to some constant temperature. If the temperature of the lab would change by one degree, and you haven't carefully driven that mass spring system at its resonance frequency, it would be out of resonance. And what you would get is instead of going up and staying there, it could go up like this, or I could, you know, it, it wouldn't be this nice thing. So this is an indication is to get this. It's also something we had to painfully learn. You really need to test exactly what the resonance is, be spot on the resonance so that you allow for small temperature fluctuations, or you control the temperature in the lab, which perhaps would have been a sensible thing to do. Uh, so then uh, you keep on driving it up to some time, and then you switch it off, and again, it just, just doesn't stop which is actually great because it would create a horrible mess. Uh, so and then it just decays down. Okay, so this is this fluid cell. Again, this is a reconstructed. This is a highly, in the highly nonlinear phase when big waves are there. And then it is three different times just to give you an idea how this interface looks like. And then here, this is a cross section in the radial direction just to show you. And then here, it means th this dashed line here is what we're losing. So we can only be in this square and divide. We can't see here because of our detection method. And so this is what we get, and this is what we're going to discuss now. What you see is 1,500 repetition. Every single repetition here is a single line on this graph. We made it very faint, and then we pulled two out, which to emphasize what's going on. So let's first look at this. So this is the time scale here from zero to 35 seconds, I think it was. And what we are plotting is the instantaneous amplitude of my ansimutal mode number M equal four, which was right in the instability band, which would be predicted by material equation to grow. There's an M plus four and an M minus four, they're symmetric. I'm only plotting one of them. What are the scales here? This is one nanometer, micrometer, one millimeter. Okay, so six orders of magnitude. Okay, so the first thing, um, what we see there are two curves that seem seemingly different. So we are switching the shaker off. I have to go back. Um, okay, this is not indicated, but this is about uh, 24 seconds. I can't quite remember what it is. So around here, which makes sense, okay? It's around here we shake, we switch it off. So uh, for care analysis, predicts that you have an exponentially growing mode, and this is a log plot. And so what you see is that here there is some noise, and I will talk about this, but then we start the shaking at t equals zero. This noise here, let's do it right away, is the detection noise of our method. So our method cannot go beyond one micrometer. That's why I'm saying our detection method is not good enough. Then you have an exponentially growing mode, and then this mode here should actually keep on exponentially growing according to the linear theory, but it saturates. And then, of course, when you stop, it plateaus, and when you stop, it comes down. While this mode here keeps on growing really until the end, what we said, and then it turns around and decays. The reason why this is initially you have a random initial state and so whatever is in that initial frequency, that what you will amplify. 
This is why it is, and it takes a while for wherever if you, this is what we need to, this is, uh, I'm just saying that now, this needs to be investigated much more carefully. If I go and extrapolate this linear line back to the beginning when I started shaking, uh, you will see that this one here, it would have been down to one nanometer. Of course, here we have to be careful and it's a very long debate on its own and a discussion and that's something we're analyzing now and we built an, an optical interferometer technique um, of axis holography to actually have a, an in, have a detection method of one nanometer, which we are now have patented, or well, put a patent application in, I should say. Uh, so we know how to resolve this in the future. And then, so then, uh, but what you see here really is that these different trajectories are really offset because depending what's just randomly there, what's your initial state, which is changing, it, may, it takes longer to amplify it. And so this is what we see. And now let's look at the linear theory. And I really have to speed up. I'm running horribly over time. So the linear theory uh, would predict an exponential growth throughout. And of course, we see what we have here, experiment and theory. Experiment, here you see this where the theory, the only thing we fix is actually the uh, distribution, the initial distribution. Our hope was that this is a nice Gaussian, getting there. Uh, but so this is a theory, this experiment, and as you can see the theory, the red here, uh, because linear would grow up, would grow until the very end and then stop. What we're using this for here, this final parts here, part of this, not very close to this, we're using this to extract the dumping rates in the system. Okay. So clearly not a very good description. The linear theory is okay. The dumping rate, you know, I mean, we can predict the dumping very well if we extract the linear, we only extract the linear dumping. That's the only parameter which we take from the system. We extract it and then the only input parameter is what is our initial distribution here. Everything else is calculated. So then what you can do, you can calculate, you can monitor the acceleration on your platform over time, the temperature over time. We have several temperature sensors. You can um, um, extract the growth rate over for the different um, time means. Every trajectory is at a different instant of time. And you can extract from these plots, this linear slope here can extract the growth rate. And you can also extract the dumping, because at the end here is a slope again, and you can extract this dumping rate. And then you can find some nice things. You can then plot all of these quantities over temperature. And what you're seeing here is that, for example, gamma, the dumping rate, how it changes linearly, how it decays with the temperature, which is predicted. And so, but if the dumping changes, your initial state also changes, fluctuation dissipation theorem. So everything's changing. So, and this is what, that's why a temperature degree change between 24 and 26, which is two degrees over the period of 50 hours, has this effect. So we didn't really repeat it. We had just had an equivalence class of effective field theory, which were roughly self-similar. Okay, so now I have to go a bit quicker because you want to have lunch and a break. So clearly, the, it's not linear, okay? So what you need to do, you have to follow this wonderful paper by Miles, and it should be written hopefully in one of the slides, who derived the variational uh, ansatz, used the variational ansatz, uh, on this interface to derive all the nonlinear terms. And all, of course, we didn't write them down, but we wrote down the cubic and the quartic terms. And what you can show is that all of these coefficients, and I have to speed up now, all of these coefficients here, they are calculated. They are not free parameters. I'd like to state it. The only free parameters is the initial distribution for our fit. And so all of these parameters can be calculated, and it turns out that the cubic terms are vanishing due to, um, uh, due to constraints onto the mode functions with, um, which are not going in. If I say it, then it takes too long. Okay, so then there are two things we want to discuss. So the first thing is, so now you have to say, there's one mode which is really, really highly occupied. So there's all this lowly, no, noisy, noisy soup, and there's one, one field mode that grows exponentially and gets really large. And this mode will now start interacting. And in the same way as in cosmology, people would argue this in inflation, they would say, well, there are all these nonlinear terms, but surely the ones that maximally involve these exponentially growing modes, these high occupied modes, these are the terms that should dominate. And that's also what Miles 
predicted in his paper many years ago where he said, look, I mean, in a way, I don't need to consider all the terms. I need to consider the ones that are, you know, through this whole nonlinear path, the ones which are involving this exponentially highly occupied mode, exponentially growing highly occupied mode, these terms should be the most relevant. And so then what you get for, there are two things, the self-interaction, the mode with itself, and then the mode scatters into other modes. And so the self-interaction term here, what's happening is you get an additional, com you get a non-linear damping term. So you have linear damping and you get a non-linear damping that depends on the amplitude of that mode. And then what the system also does, it says, well, look, I cannot grow exponentially forever. So it increases the damping and it, it helps the mode, it changes the frequency of the mode to move it out of the resonance regime. It's a very sensible thing to do. The, the stochastic term does not change because uh, n all, nothing is scattering into this, right? Nothing is sourcing this. All the other fluctuations are small. Okay, and then here if you do this, take these terms into account, the relevant ones, uh, get and you do a theory experiment fit, you will see now uh, no free parameter added by going from linear to nonlinear. I just want to stress this once more, you got a wonderful agreement. Okay, so now um, I have to say, uh, yeah, so now you could say, aren't you happy? N well, no, uh, yes and no, but then sometimes when you have this, you say, well, I have one nonlinear theory that seems to fit. Could some other linear theory could also fit? We should be always cautious. So one thing one would really like to have is an theory agnostic way to know if your, my field modes are interacting or not. And so there are these wonderful methods uh, developed by uh, Jörg Schmidmeier and Jürgen Berges. And Jörg Schmidmeier is doing ultra cold atoms experiments. And Jürgen Berges is a cosmologist. Sebastian Erne uh, is a member of our team and was a postdoc in my group for, 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 for three years. And so what, um, what they're doing is they are looking at uh, the, what the paper is. They want to extract, let me show that. They want to extract the effective field theory. That's what we're doing. We want to nail down the effective field theory on this liquid, liquid interface. And in these papers, they adapted methods from field theory in their system, quantum field theory, in our system, thermal field theory, uh, how to uh, extract, uh, for example, to pin down if a field theory is interacting or not. And so what you do is you look at higher moments. And these higher moments, so these are correlation functions. And I have to tell you on what, uh, but let me first talk you through. So what you're saying is if I have a Gaussian state, that in field theory language would mean I have a free field theory. My modes are not interacting. And there is a theorem and that states, well, if I have a Gaussian field theory and I calculate higher moments, higher order correlation functions, I can always decompose them into the disconnected correlation function, into pairs of correlation functions. And in general, any higher full correlation function would have the disconnected part, if it's Gaussian, this is all there is, but if it's not Gaussian, it also has irreducible terms or connected correlation function, meaning it interacts. And so this is the whole thing in there. And now you can say, let me write down higher moments, higher order correlation functions, and let me check if they actually can be written as this uh, disconnected functions. If I can fully express it in terms of disconnected correlation functions or if there is an irreducible term. If that's there, then the thing is interacting. That's what we do. Uh, we extract this. This is why we did the statistical approach. So now we have a measure that doesn't care about the theory. I'm just using basic statistics. And that allows me to see if my modes are interacting or not. We actually extract it up to 12th order, but signal to noise ratio is not very meaningful. So what we're plotting is up to sixth order correlation functions. This is just a two-point correlation function uh, which can be used in a statistics way to actually extract um, exponential growth and dumping as well. So forget about this. We, we can do this in a single trajectory here. It's not a quantum system. 
And so what we see initially here, this is the statistics, the noise uh, distribution in our system. Initially, it seems Gaussian, but this is because the detection noise is Gaussian, and we know the Gaussian thing. What it would actually, what we would require that the connected part is zero if it's Gaussian. What we see that there is a constant, it's constant, it's not zero. So it means there was some correlation in our initial state. Why that is, we don't know, but we will find out with our interferometer. So there's some initial correlation in our system that may be there because of the finite size. However, in the linear phase, this correlation is not changing because it's a linear dynamics. It doesn't change the, the correlations in the system. But when it becomes nonlinear, this, 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 the connected part is changing. And so you get this change in these higher moments exactly when the theory becomes nonlinear. And this is what we're seeing here. Now we can see, get an exact prediction when you go from linear to nonlinear. Okay. And then we want one more thing. We wanted to study. So this is how we, uh, we this is the primary excited bonds here. And then we see that there's a scattering into a secondary, which is three times the omega naught. That's also what's predicted from preheating what should be happening. But preheating predicts something else. It predicts that you should not just scatter into three omega naught. It has to then grow with three times of this um, exponential growth rate. So if this is the slope of the primary, the slope of the Second, uh, secondary, which is three times omega naught, has to grow three times as fast. And so again, we have theory and experiment um, comparison. Note that there is also, for, um, for care analysis predicts that it, um, it could also excite the three times omega naught band, but with a different um, growth rate. And um, this thing here in the experiment, this little deviation uh, we explain in the paper in very detail why we have this and where this is coming from. So what is happening, this mode here starts to become non, starts to, uh, at this point one would say, oh, the mode here is clearly nonlinear. But what's really happening here is that this mode already starts um, decaying into the secondary. So while here seemingly, it's seemingly still linear, it starts decaying into this secondary bond. Which secondary bond is can be populated again, can be calculated through, is in agreement with our theoretical prediction. Now we, we needed to check if it's really three times the primary. So if this is the primary um, log slope, the growth rate, and if you take it times three, uh, then you will see that this is exactly where the secondary lies. And then you can see how you get the spreading. Initially you have, uh, what you get is the M mode stays conserved. That uh, can be explained due to symmetries, why this has to be. And what's happening is you start occupying a higher KR mode because you go into a different frequency band. And so here from the primary, how it starts to populate the secondary and slowly then, um, in, then the analogy at some point breaks down. In cosmology, what's believed that this spreading would continue and it would, the universe would thermalize. And that's, that's really it, and I'm running so much over time. Um, uh, I just stop. Thank you so much. Thank you, Silke. <laughs> right, questions, uh, please. Thank you, Silke, for this nice talk. Uh, I have a question. I was uh, impressed by your nice result uh, where you study correlation. You see departure from Gaussianity yeah. due to, um, in, uh, yes, uh, interaction. Know. So you, you know, uh, well, you, you, you will know that uh, for uh, quantum information being Gaussian or not, or not is really an issue. Um, and could it be that it, this can bring some uh, light to the information loss paradox that this uh, uh, nonlinearity could affect uh, the, 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 the information loss uh, for, for a black hole. So where is it coming from? In order to answer this question, where this is coming, where is it coming from, this initi that the initial state has some correlation? A thermal state, if your initial, st okay, if it's a quantum vacuum, uh, but if it's a thermal state, initially it should be uncorrelated. This, I don't, I don't believe it is being created uh, through the 
ramp at the beginning. I don't think it is being created. It needs to be checked as well. Uh, this is because this is between the different trajectories, really, where we sample. I, I have a feeling it comes through th due to the finite size system and so we have this reduced density of states, but also I believe it is um, uh, the vibrational noise. So I think it is, it is just something that is due to the way we conduct the experiments. In other words, it, would that still be there if you have an infinite system? So I, I don't know, I have to say, we don't know why. If, if we could go back, so the first thing we need to do, the very first thing we need to do, and this is what we're working on, so we developed this new, new technique, which is fantastic, actually. We want to look what is here. First, I want to make sure it's not being created, maybe because of when the shaker amplitude ramps up. That is not something we, we are accidentally exciting in a pseudo dynamics, pseudo linear dynamics, okay? Because the linear dynamics, the, well, but we are also, t we are taking this into account. We're taking also in the simulation, we take this, um, driving force into account. We're taking this ramp also into account. But is there something else that happens? I don't know. Is it that we are creating it? Okay, so we have to make sure that this n that's something that's intrinsic to the initial state. So all we need to do is take a fluid cell and just mono it without moving it and try to understand the initial state in the system. Uh, if then this correlation is still there, then we need to think of what is creating it. I'm a bit in the dark. I would imagine that the confinement could maybe cause something. Some misalignment, some tiny thing. I have, to be honest, I'm puzzled by it. Um, some, some systematic vibrations. We have better optical noise isolating, um, better noise isolating platforms in the other lab, in the new lab. I don't know. I, I have to be honest, I just don't know what it is. It's driving me a bit mad, but I, we don't know what it is. it is. But I think it is fair to say it seems to be um, persistent. It seems, it, it's, I don't think this is, um, I also have to say, if we, if we put into initial state, if we put this correlation in, this is how, so we create an initial state with some correlation, which would fit this linear plateau. If we put it as an initial state, this correlation, and then use this in a simulation all the way, it would describe wonderfully what's going on. So I think it is there, I just don't know why. And I don't think in around a black hole it's necessary that, there has, that this would also be there. So I don't think this is something you can map on t on t onto the gravity domain. That was a wonderful overview. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicola asked about foundational studies of quantum mechanics uh, using quantum simulators and how your mathematical insight might help us understand our experiments. I don't know if you thought about the gravitational extensions of quantum uh, and how the upcoming experiments uh, that are uh, interfacing quantum with at least classical gravity or even special relativity sort of level gravity, let alone GR, how um, those might connect to some of your uh, predictions. Uh, would, you know, a lot of what you're doing is, is sort of assuming, as far as I understand, that, that quantum mechanics operates in the normal way, it's not impacted by gravity at all. But if, is it, if it is impacted by gravity, are there differences in some of your predictions that would uh, be apparent, for example, in upcoming nanomechanical experiments or multi-component BC experiments when they're much larger? So my five cent answer to this is, so first of all, this is, the, the, the easy answer would be no connection. But they think that's not quite truthful. So what it is, um, it's about, um, what the analogs are very sensible for is, is to get a very deep understanding of the systems and using tools developed that could be used for um, a variety of different um, experimentation where one looks at um, gravitational effects in, in combination with superfluids, not fluids perhaps, because you're interested in quantum gravity or uh, semi-classical. Um, I want to say more. Um, well, one, I think whenever we work with a system and want to use it as a sensor or a, as something bigger, we really need to have an extremely deep understanding. And what I feel is like perhaps this, this general scheme to extract this effective field theory to this precision 
and even better than we are doing. This is just the beginning, especially in all these ultra-cold atom systems. I think this is needed to really use it as a detector, for example, not just as a simulator. So I think that in general, like people who are working on this interface uh, can bring some value to any other collaboration. So I would say it's my students are ideal to sort of make connections and learning concepts and toolboxes from two different fields. And this can then be applied to other interesting studies. So yes, I think you know, there's huge potential there and that combining different areas especially the ones you had in mind, is, is a fantastic idea. Right, so for example, most of the predictions for quantum influenced by classical gravity are very much on mean field or center of mass or something close to that, but you discuss Schmiedmeier's work and his uh, higher order correlation measurements, yeah. and so I'm wondering if, um, you know, curve space time or deviation from curve space time model can be sensitive at higher, quarter, higher order correlations to some of those gravitational modifications of quantum, so that's, that's sort of what I had in mind. Yes. Yeah, no, I think, to be honest, we, I mean, it was through the discussions with Jörg that initially, when Jörg started looking at, uh, we're long-term collaborators and we meet once a year for, I don't know, eight years or whatever, and we would get together in Vienna in a nice cafe house. And I remember six years ago, he was telling me about this methods and he seemed really worried because he said, how well do I understand the system? And he was in a crisis. And that sort of pushed me into a crisis because it uh, made me realize I, I need to know that as well. And so I think it is this, um, it is clearly I was motivated from Jörg, but here what is nice, in principle, I have to deliver nicer results because when I interact with my system, I don't destroy it, right? I can measure it. I mean, I, I do heat it up by inter, I, I, do, I do interfere with it, but these effects are so small that it's negligible at the temperatures we are doing this. So, um, I think that you know there is a stepping change to me how people do also these ultra cold atoms experiments and they are simply getting better and better in terms of control but also in terms of the theory understanding of those right sometimes and 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 having that extra layer of theory understanding in these new methods allow you again to enhance the control so it's a constant feedback loop between theory and experiment which which I believe uh, analog gravity also is contributing to Right, I think that we are going terribly out of time, so uh, maybe I'll suggest to ask for the question to Silke during the lunch break. And let's thank Silke and Gennady for the session. Thank you.